Okay, welcome back after the break. We'll continue. So before the break, we were looking at verses uh, 1 to verse 8. Any one of you have any questions, doubts, anything you'd like to share about verses 1 to 8? Anyone? Verses 1 to 8. Any questions? Any doubts? Okay, if not, we'll uh, move on to verses 8 to 16. Can one of you want to, would like to read 8 to 16, please? Yeah, please go ahead, Kanan. Eight to sixteen. Can you hear? He's having me? some internet issues, I think. Now, can you hear me? Yeah, a little more louder, please. Uh, now. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay, I will read. This is eight to sixteen. Uh, sixteen. Okay. Therefore, uh, though I might be very bold in Christ, Christ to command you what is fitting, it uh, for love, love's sake, um, I rather appeal to you, being such a one as Paul, the aged, and now also a prisoner of Christ, I appeal to you for my son Onosimus, who, whom I have begotten while in my chains, who once was unprofitable to you, but now he's profitable to you and to me. I'm sending him back. You therefore receive him. That is my own heart, whom I uh, wish to keep with me, that on your behalf he might minister to me in my chains for the gospel, but without your consent I wanted to do nothing that your good deeds might not be by compulsion, as it were, but voluntary. For perhaps he departed for a while for this purpose, that you might receive him forever, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave, a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. Thank you, Kanan. So here Paul goes on to request Philemon now to receive his runaway slave Onesimus. So he says, therefore, though I might be very bold in Christ to command you what is fitting, uh, Paul uh, has authority uh, to command Philemon what to do, but he uh, does not want to use his authority to command Philemon uh, to receive back his runaway slave with kindness uh, uh, rather than hatred and anger, uh, but he prefers to make his appeal on the basis of the Christian relationship that they have. The, the love that they ho both have as brothers in Christ, um, uh, that they belong to the family of Christ and, they, and uh, they have one father that is God himself. So based on the Christian relationship, Christian love that binds them together uh, as believers together in Christ, on those basis, he wants to make his appeal to Philemon to receive back Onesimus. He says bold, the word me, bold here means uh, boldness, confidence, frankness, uh, openness, or just saying it plainly. So Paul is saying, I have much boldness and openness. That means uh, he's saying that I could be very bold uh, to give you an authoritative command. Uh, and Paul is basing his boldness uh, because of who he is in Christ uh, or uh, that Christ has given him the boldness to tell Philemon uh, what to do. As we see in the uh, CEV uh, version, it says, Christ gives me the courage to tell you what to do. Okay, uh, And he says, what is fitting? In some versions, it says what is required or what should be done. So basically, Paul is telling Philemon that with the boldness that Christ gives him, he can command Philemon 
to do what is required or to do what is fitting or uh, we could also mean what is proper for Philemon as a Christian uh, to do in the circumstances concerning Onesimus. But in verse 9, he writes, yet for love's sake, I rather appeal to you. So Paul is saying that, um, you know, I could be bold and order you what to do, uh, but I would rather not use my boldness. That's why he does not introduce himself as Paul in the support, apostle of Christ, but introduces himself in the greetings as Paul, a prisoner of Christ. And he says, you know, he does that because he basically wants to uh, make his appeal to a uh, son out of love. Okay, uh, so love in the sense of brotherly love that they share, um, being such as one as Paul, he's also reminding uh, Philemon uh, and laying the, uh, uh, you know, the ground for uh, Paul's right to command. And so what is uh, Paul's right to command? First of all, uh, he says about his age, uh, the aged, that's what he writes. Yet for love's sake, I rather appeal to you being such a one as Paul, the aged, okay? Uh, so uh, many translations say old man, uh, which basically in the Greek, uh, it's a word used for presbyter. That means an elder or a leader of a church. So old man in the Greek translation means presbyter, uh, somebody who's an elder or a leader of the church. And that is why the RSV translation says, uh, you know, ambassador. Okay, the word in the RSV says ambassador, um, which would put a stress on the authority about who Paul is. Okay, so Paul is saying that he's doing this as an old man, uh, which means someone who is wise and experienced um, uh, with the, all of carrying all of these years uh, uh, and the authority that he carried all through these years. So he's basically talking about his age. Um, about his uh, how uh, with age comes wisdom, experience, and the authority that he's carried throughout those years. So on those, uh, on that age, he's uh, making his appeal. He's also making it out of love, and also as a prisoner of Jesus Christ. So he makes appeal as an old man, and now as a prisoner who belongs to uh, Christ. Um, uh, so, but you know, he could do all of these. He could persuade he could uh, uh, he could tell um, uh, Philemon based on his age uh, uh, his authority as an apostle also the authority that he has over um, Philemon because it was because of him that he uh, accepted Christ um, you know and also as a prisoner of Christ who belongs to Christ um, but Paul says I prefer to make my persuasion based on love uh, instead of obedience by order so after all, he was talking about Philemon's private possession. Onesimus was still Philemon's slave. Verse 10, verse 10 says, I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten while in my chains. So he says, uh, I'm making an appeal. I'm urging to you. Uh, I'm beseeching you. Uh, and making an appeal to you, Philemon, on behalf of Onesimus, an appeal that I'm making on the grounds of love. And look at how he talks about Onesimus. He says, for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten while in uh, chains. Now we know that Paul often speaks of his uh, uh, converts, those he led to Christ as his children. Uh, we read this, uh, you know, uh, he talks about Timothy as his son. Uh, Titus as his son, we saw in Titus chapter 1, verse 4. Uh, he also talks about the Corinthian Christians as his children. We read this in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 14. He also talks about the Galatian Christians as his children. Uh, we read this in Galatians chapter 4, verse uh, 19. So each of them were Paul's children. Um, and what a joy it must have been for Paul, you know, under the most miserable circumstances in prison, to lead a man to Christ. So we see that, you know, uh, you know, physical chains, 
uh, physical circumstances, physical situations and challenges that we face are no way limitations uh, to spiritual fruitfulness. Even if you look at some of the great missionaries, uh, you know, we, we know that many of them who travel to places like uh, Burma, uh, Kolkata, India, uh, you know, to, uh, to African uh, uh, the continent of Africa, they faced so many difficult challenges. They lost their wife, their children died. Uh, they were themselves uh, uh, unwell and sick. Uh, but we see them, you know, in spite of all that, continuing on with the call and the purpose and the uh, mission. So, you know, we may go through a lot of physical uh, challenges, mental challenges, emotional challenges, losing of our loved ones. Uh, yes, they're all very difficult situations to be in, but, you know, God can still use that. Um, and there are no uh, ways, a limitation for us to be spiritually uh, fruitful even in our lives, not even old age. Uh, see Paul writing here, he's old, uh, but even in his old age, he was able to to lead people to Christ, write letters, uh, do his spiritual moral responsibility, what God has called him to, to encourage people like Timothy and Titus, who he writes letters from prison. Um, okay, so it's not um, any physical circumstances are no way limitations to our spiritual fruitfulness. Okay, we do not know how many people Paul led uh, to the Lord while he was in prison. Um, uh, but we know from uh, reading the book of Philippians that, uh, you know, when he was in chains in prison, uh, he shared the gospel even uh, with those uh, who were the guards. It says in Philippians chapter 1, verse 12 and 13, But I want you to know, brethren, that the things which happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel, so that it has become evident to the whole palace guard and to all the rest that my chains are in Christ. So we see that even in prison, Paul uses the opportunity to minister to those uh, who are the guards, soldiers, the palace guards, uh, just minister to them, share the love of Jesus, uh, the gospel of Christ Jesus, and lead them into personal salvation. Verse 11, uh, who once was unprofitable to you, but now is profitable to you and uh, to me. Now, Paul states that Onesimus uh, was once useless, uh, but is now useful uh, because now he has become a Christian, um, you know, and actually, if you see, Paul is playing on words here. What do I mean by Paul is playing on words here? The word Onesimus means profitable and useful. Okay, when uh, the, the meaning of the name Onesimus means profitable or useful. So he's saying, yes, you know, Onesimus was once useless for you. He ran away. It was of no use. Uh, but now he is useful uh, because, you know, he's become a believer in Christ Jesus. And as a believer, he will live up to his name of being profitable and useful so something that we can learn you know when we are unbelievers uh, in our own sinful state there's nothing profitable and useful about us but once we become new believers uh, once we become new creation uh, in christ jesus we receive a purpose we our lives become meaningful um our lives become purposeful, uh, our lives, um, uh, you know, uh, 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 manifest the glory of God for which we are created. And we live true to, uh, you know, our names to whom uh, and also to what, who God has called us to be, to what he has called us to be and to the position that he has um, raised us to be, that we are sons and daughters, we're seated in heavenly realms um, um, and our position of who we are in. Christ. So he's saying that, you know, he, uh, he was once useless, but now he's profitable. He's profitable to me. He's been very useful to me uh, in the ministry. Um, he's assisted Paul uh, during his uh, house arrest. Um, so Philemon's runaway Onesimus was now unprofitable to Philemon since he had escaped, but now he has become profitable or, or useful to Paul. Uh, since Philemon loved Paul, Paul, if Onesimus had helped Paul, uh, he was helping Philemon as uh, well. Okay, so he's, he's, he's meaning to say that, uh, 
you know, um, since Paul and Philemon are brothers in Christ, they love each other. If Onesimus, uh, you know, when the time, the period when he ran away from Philemon, uh, he was uh, of no use to Philemon because he was of no help. But uh, when he was with Paul, that period he was helping Paul. And since he was helping Paul, it was the same way as he was helping Philemon uh, because both Paul and Philemon are brothers, one and the same. Okay, so either he was helping Paul the same way he was helping, uh, it meant also that he was helping Philemon. Okay. Um, so by making this clear to Philemon, Paul is gently hitting or hinting that he would like to keep back Onesimus for the, for the service of the gospel, um, um, you know, but uh, he would rather not command uh, Philemon uh, to do what uh, he wants, but he just makes this appeal and request out of love uh, if he would be willing to send back Onesimus so that Paul can use him for the um, ministry, okay? Um, so here we, like I said, we learned a good lesson or we learned something uh, until Onesimus was uh, not found by Christ. He was lost, uh, you know, spiritually lost. Uh, he was unuseful, unprofitable. But when he encountered Christ, he became useful and profitable. Same like Paul. You know, Paul, uh, he was not useful to the Christians. He was persecuting them, put, throwing them into prison. But uh, once he encountered Christ, he had that uh, encounter to, uh, with Christ on the road to Damascus. Uh, you know, after that, we see his life being so profitable and useful for the, uh, for the sake of God's kingdom and for Jesus Christ himself. Okay. And uh, here we see that, you know, when we are not in Christ, we have a fallen identity, which causes us to run away from responsibilities, uh, steal, uh, do things that are uh, of the uh, evil world, uh, of uh, the devil. But when we find our identity in Christ, we find our purpose, we find our meaning, uh, we uh, live true to our relationships. And that is why we see Onesimus uh, agreeing to go back. It's not Paul forcing him to go back, but Onesimus agrees to go back. You know, a slave will never agree to go back to the master because they know they can be crucified. They can be killed by their master for running away and nobody will say anything because that is what's the law of the land. Uh, they can do that. And uh, so, he, you know, Onesimus knows he could be even killed uh, by Philemon, but uh, his new identity in Christ uh, you know, gives him a new sense of responsibility, accountability, um, um, uh, you know, a sense of uh, uh, being honest uh, to go back, to say sorry, and uh, to do what is morally, morally and uh, spiritually and socially right. And I think, you know, that's a good learning to, and, uh, to keep a check on ourselves, you know, is our identity in Christ, who we are in Christ, is it? Uh, showing forth in our responsibilities, in the way we do things, uh, when, you know, our uh, leaders or the ministry that we're working, the mission organization that we're working, the church that we're working to, when it gives us a responsibility, do we just do it for the sake of doing it with half-heartedness just to complete it? Or do we do it with sincerity, with faithfulness, with integrity, with faithfulness, giving a hundred percent, being excellent in what we do? That is what uh, God is looking for: excellence. Uh, you know, are we sincere in our relationships that we share with the uh, people? Are we honest in our relationships? Uh, people are we willing to uh, when we do wrong when we're willing to acknowledge that we have done wrong go back and set things right or do we run away from it uh, we see that Onesimus you know showed great uh, uh, spiritual character uh, integrity in just going back wanting to set things right even though even uh, knowing that you know he might lose his very uh, life okay so now we come to the core of this letter or the center of this letter. Um, what happens, you know, to a human being when he becomes a new creature in Christ? What happens to his uh, human relationship, his social position? 
how does it uh, influence his perception of a reality? And, um, uh, you know, and we see this in Onesimus, we see what's happening is Onesimus and he, uh, you know, wants to return to his master um, uh, and uh, he agrees to accept his position as a slave, even though he knows he's been set free by Christ. Okay. And also we see that Paul sends Onesimus back to the place from which he ran away. Um, uh, maybe Onesimus has uh, accepted Paul's advice. Uh, he could always run away again, even from Paul. Uh, but we see that uh, the very fact that uh, this epistle is in the Bible is a proof that he did not, that he did go back to uh, Philemon. Uh, he goes back to his master on his free will. Uh, in obedience to God and not just in what Paul is asking him to do. So it's important that we live our lives in obedience to Christ, do our things out of obedience in love for Christ. Even though ministry is hard, it's not easy, uh, you know, but we do it in perfection, in excellence, because we have a God, a God of excellence and a God of perfection. Verse 12, he says, I'm sending him back you to you, therefore receive him. That is my own heart. So Paul is taking the initiative to send Onesimus back to his master, um, you know, and he's saying, uh, therefore receive him, that is my own heart. Yes, uh, Paul acknowledges that Onesimus has done wrong, he has escaped from his master, it was time for him to set things right, um, so Paul was willing to send him back, but you know, obviously he wanted uh, Philemon to deal gently with Onesimus, um, under the Roman law, you know, slave owner could um, uh, have has complete control over his slaves. Um, and it was unusual for slaves who ran away if they were caught. Uh, the only offense was they could be crucified. Okay. Uh, and we see that, um, you know, this law came about because in the Roman world, there were uh, around 60 million slaves. Okay, that's a huge number, 60 million slaves. And there was a constant fear in the hearts of the people that these 60 million, if they got together, uh, they could uh, revolt and no one could stop them. So the laws uh, for the slaves were very, very strict and also especially for runaway slaves. So if a slave who had run away was caught, uh, they might be crucified or they, you know, would be branded with a red hot iron, you know, they would, uh, uh, on their forehead, their forehead, they would put a, a letter F, which talks about fugitive, that means a runaway uh, person, a runaway slave, uh, they would put that with red hot iron there, uh, the word F. So, um, you know, considering this, uh, you know, Paul understands and knows what would be the, you know, can be the uh, situation, so Paul is using this word, um, you know, that is my own heart. So Philemon, he says, I know that this man has done wrong to you. He deserves punishment, but consider him uh, as my own heart, as if to say it was, it was me myself and be merciful uh, to me. Okay. Um, so we see Paul's genuine love for his new son in the faith. And he sees his concern for his son, even as he goes back. Verse 13, he says, whom I wish to keep with me, that on your behalf he might minister to me in chains for the gospel. So clearly we see that Paul wanted Onesimus to stay back because he's a big help for him. Uh, but we know that it was not right for him to do it. So Paul, uh, you know, also we see how Paul is being right as a leader and fulfilling his spiritual, social and moral responsibility. He sends him back. Uh, but, you know, he makes an appeal to uh, Philemon. He makes his appeal in three ways here. First, he says, if Onesimus stayed, he could serve Paul on your behalf. That means he's telling Philemon, if you leave Onesimus with me, it's like you serving me because Onesimus is your rightful servant. And if he's serving me, it's like you are serving me. Secondly, he means that if Onesimus stayed, he helped a man in chains. That's what he says in verse, writes in verse 30. So what he means here, uh, basically Paul is writing, saying, Philemon, I know Onesimus might be of some use to you. 
uh, but you know, considering that I am in prison, I am in chains. I need all the help I can get, so he can be more useful for me than to you because I am in chains. Thirdly, if Onesimus stayed and he helped a man in chains for the gospel, that is what he we read here. You know, in the latter half of verse thirteen, uh, that he might minister to me in my chains for the gospel. So what Paul is basically trying to say. Uh, right to Philemon is Philemon. Please don't forget why I'm here in chains. Remember that it's for the sake of the gospel. And uh, you know, if Onesimus stays back and helps me, or comes back to me and helps me, it'll be all for the sake of the gospel and not just for my personal use. Okay. In verse fourteen, uh, but with your consent, I wanted to do nothing that your good deeds might not be by compulsion as it were, but voluntary. So he says, I don't want to force you, uh, but I'm just making an appeal to you. The decision is left to you. I just appeal in love. Uh, I don't want to trample on your rights uh, that you have Philemon over your slave. Um, then Paul is saying that, you know, if he demands Philemon and Philemon has to meet the demand, then, you know, it would be like uh, he's just meeting a demands of the Apostle Paul. But if uh, Philemon makes a decision, then, you know, it would be like one of the good deeds that Philemon himself has done. He has done on his own will, not out of compulsion. It would have, he would do it voluntary. Uh, and that would make it more beautiful. Uh, when people see it, people will learn from Philemon as a master what he did for his slave. Um, and, uh, you know, but if he would do it on compulsion, then, you know, it would become very uh, unpleasant. He would be very sad, disappointed. Uh, maybe his, he would not even want to relate with uh, Paul after this and would also rob uh, Philemon of any reward that he might get for his good deeds. So he's saying, I'll just make the appeal in love. I leave it to you to decide because if you do it voluntary, if you send him back, then you would be the one who will receive the rewards. Uh, your good deeds would be known. People would know and uh, you will receive the reward, okay? Verse 15, he says, for perhaps he departed for a while for this purpose that you might receive him forever, okay? Now, Onesimus running away made him a criminal and he possibly deserves a death penalty. Uh, but, you know, in all of this, Paul sees a purpose uh, of God. He wanted Philemon to also see the purpose that Paul is seeing, um, that, you know, Onesimus ran away, but it was for a good reason. He encountered Christ. Now he's changed and he can be useful to Philemon and to Paul in the ministry in serving Christ in a totally new perspective, uh, um, rather than with anger, compulsion and force. Okay. Verse 16, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave, beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. So Paul is reintroducing Onesimus here, not as a slave, but as a brother. Uh, in this relationship, uh, as brothers and not as slaves, uh, Paul is, uh, you know, abolishing the master-slave relationship. And he is laying the foundation, uh, you know, uh, for a uh, you know, total uh, eradication of slavery. Uh, and he's saying, you know, if a man is a stranger, I might make him a slave, but how can my brother become my slave? So if somebody who's a total stranger to me, I can keep him as a slave. But if he's my brother, how can I treat him as a slave? So he's telling Philemon, now, you know, uh, Onesimus is a brother in Christ. You know, both of you are brothers. Three of us are brothers in Christ because we belong to the family of God. Then how can we look at Onesimus as a slave? He cannot be seen as a slave because he said uh, he is a brother in uh, Christ. So Onesimus is not like a slave. He's uh, not a slave. He's no longer still a slave. Um, uh, in the fullest sense, now he is more a brother in the Lord. So Onesimus is dear to Paul uh, with respect to earthly relationship, uh, both as a person and a follower of Christ Jesus. Then um, verses 17 to 22, Philemon's uh, uh, obedience is encouraged. So can somebody read verses 17 to 22, please? Uh, which is also his ending greetings. Yeah. 
If then you count me as a partner, receive as you would me. But if he has a wrong to you or owes anything, put that on my account. I found I'm writing with my own hand. I will repay. Not to mention you that you owe me even you, even your own beside. Yes, brother. Let me have joy from you in the Lord. Crush my heart in the Lord. Verses 21 and 22 as well, Thomas. Having confidence in your obedience, I write to you, knowing that you even more than I say. But meanwhile, all there are guest room for me, but I trust that through your prayers I shall be granted to you. Thank you. So here in verse 17, Paul is saying, uh, you know, taking another step further, he's saying, you know, uh, when Onesimus comes, receive him in the same manner that you would receive me. Okay, as if I, I myself have come uh, to you. So Paul is actually asking Philemon to treat Onesimus as if he were uh, Paul, okay, himself. And verse 18, he says, if he has wronged you or owes you anything, put that into my account. We know that uh, Paul, uh, Onesimus not only escaped from Philemon, uh, this itself is a capital punishment, but we also see that he is stolen from him, uh, which is also a bigger crime. Uh, so he says, whatever he's stolen it, put it into my account. You know, when I come and meet you, I will pay back what he has uh, stolen. Verse 19, he says, uh, I, Paul, am writing with my own hand. I will repay, not to mention to you that you owe me your very, uh, even your own self besides. So Paul uh, can afford to pay Onesimus' expenses uh, because uh, there was a sense in which Philemon owed Paul, but there was a sense in which Philemon owed Paul his own salvation um, uh, because Paul, uh, because of Paul, you know, Philemon had uh, accepted Christ. He was instrumental. Paul was being instrumental in Onesimus' conversion. Uh, so he says that that is something that you can, he can never pay uh, Paul back. But uh, Paul only gently reminds him of the fact uh, as a reason uh, why he should deal kindly with Onesimus for Paul's sake, because Paul was the one who led Philemon uh, to accept Christ. So he's also indebted to him. Uh, but he's not saying that, uh, you know, you have to pay me for that. And so because that is a greater payment than what Onesimus would have stolen, he's not meaning to say that. But he's just stating the fact so that, you know, uh, uh, Philemon can deal kindly with Paul for, for uh, with Onesimus for Paul's sake. And verse 20 says, Yes, brother, let me have joy from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in the Lord. Now, the word joy, again, Paul uses here very, very, uh, you know, meaningfully. Uh, the word joy literally means profit. Uh, the, uh, the, the translation in the ancient Greek for the word uh, only me. Okay, from the word, the root word for Onesimus, uh, the Greek word oni means uh, profit, uh, which also means joy. So again, Paul is playing on words here uh, on the name Onesimus uh, to communicate a request. So he says, let me have uh, Onesimus, which means joy. So let me have joy back from you in the Lord. Okay, so he's playing again on words because the word Onesimus comes from the root, uh, ancient uh, root word of Greek, which says Onimi, which means joy or profit. So he says, let me have Onesimus back from you in the Lord. Uh, and that's what he's stating here when he means the word joy. Okay. Refresh my heart in the Lord. So earlier in the letter, we see Paul uh, telling Philemon that he was a man who refreshed the hearts of the saints. Um, in verse 7, he says this, and now he's specifically telling Philemon uh, that he would refresh Paul's heart by allowing Onesimus to stay with Paul. Okay. Verse 21, having confidence in your obedience, I write to you knowing that you will do even more than I say. So Paul summarizes his requests in saying, I write to you with obedience, with confidence because I have confidence in you. Uh, you know, uh, we see that uh, Paul is making appeal here. He knows Philemon is not a bad or a harsh man. 
and Paul had every reason to uh, expect that uh, he would, uh, Philemon would to fulfill his Christian duty more than even what Paul has asked or required uh, or looking forward uh, to what Philemon will do. Verse 22, but meanwhile, prepare a guest room for me, for I trust that through your prayers, I shall be granted to you. So he says, uh, you know, I want to, I will come and meet you. I'm longing to come and meet you. Um, uh, so, you know, uh, you know, I will look forward for your hospitality again. Uh, and then he says, uh, pray for me, uh, you know, so that I can be released from a prison. And then, you know, and I can go back on my journeys to refresh the saints, to, uh, you know, meet the churches and also to meet you as well. And then he gives the farewell in verses 23 to 25. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, greets you as do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, Luke, uh, my fellow laborers. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. So it talks about Epaphras. Epaphras, we have already mentioned about him in the introduction. Uh, he was obviously somebody who was known to the churches at Colossae. Uh, he used to once reside there. It would possibly even be the place of his birth. Um, and Paul calls Epaphras as my fellow prisoner. It does not be. It does not mean that he was also in chains or he was also in uh, prison. Uh, just uh, means a descriptive term for a believer, a Christian uh, who is uh, living under the. Uh, you know, lordship of Christ, living under the obedience of Christ, just like Paul calls himself in a spiritual sense, a prisoner of Christ Jesus. So he says, Epaphras uh, sends greetings as well. Um, um, you know, and we know that Epaphras actually takes his letter to Philemon and to uh, the, the letter of Colossians to the church at Colossae. Okay. And also, Paul passes on greetings from Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke. Uh, who is Mark here? It's basically John Mark who had uh, joined Paul and Barnabas on their first missionary journey. We know that at the end of the first missionary journey, he does not want to continue again. And uh, Paul is very disappointed and angry with him. And when they want to go on the second missionary journey, uh, Barnabas wants to take along with him uh, John Mark, who is his nephew. And Paul refuses and they've become you know, a sharp disagreement between them. And so we see that, uh, uh, you know, Paul goes along with Silas and uh, uh, Barnabas takes John Mark and goes along with him. I, I mentioned about this in the introduction uh, to Titus. Okay, so that is about Mark. Aristarchus was one of uh, Paul's most faithful companions. Um, uh, he was, uh, you know, one of the two was seized by the mob uh, when there was an uproar in Ephesus. And now he's with Paul while Paul was in prison. But Demas, we already looked at this uh, person in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10. Paul writes about him. Uh, you know, he was someone who was very useful for Paul uh, through his, uh, uh, you know, Paul's uh, ministry days. But in his last imprisonment at Rome, uh, you know, we see that Demas uh, left Paul, left uh, his ministry, left Jesus Christ for the love of the world. And that is how we know uh, by reading uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10, where Paul writes and says to Timothy, Demas, because he has loved the world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. And then he also talks about Luke, uh, Luke who joined Paul during his second missionary journey. Uh, when they boarded a ship to Taurus and he stayed with Paul till the end of his life. And Paul calls him as our dear friend, Luke, the doctor, okay, who writes the book of Acts. Um, and we see that in 2 Timothy also, when Paul was in his last days, his uh, Roman imprisonment, he says, only Luke is with me. And then Paul uh, ends this letter by saying, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Uh, the CEV translation says, I pray that the Lord Jesus Christ would be kind to you. And uh, the TV, TEV translation says, be with you all. So basically, uh, it's Paul's prayer that Lord Jesus Christ be with them all and be kind to them all. Okay, so this is uh, about the book of Philemon. So any of you have any questions, any doubts?
about Philemon. So we finished first, second Timothy, we finished Titus and Philemon. We finished all our portions for this course. Anyone has any questions on Philemon? I hope these books were uh, meaningful and effective, even as uh, some of us are engaging in ministry, even in our personal lives. There's so much that we could uh, learn from these uh, four books. Any of you would like to share your thoughts? Yes, and, uh, uh... Four books are very um, meaningful, and uh, so many to take away in these books. Yeah. Especially as we are ministering, we need we need the characteristics of God. We need the attributes of God. So, uh, what is mentioned in First Timothy and Second Timothy is uh, today uh, when we read about the Philemon um, as a Gentile rich person, the slave, the runaway, but still. Uh, Christ, he has the heart to forgive and receive him as a brother in Christ and calls him back. At the same time, uh, the slave is uh, completely, uh, he submit to God and went to the master, even he ready to die. He, he came, but confidently, he faithfully, he went back. And, uh, he, 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 he himself uh, submit to his master. So wonderful narrative things are here. Uh, so many things uh, we learn from these books. Um, this these books are really a blessing for us. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you for sharing your thoughts. You can also use these notes to preach. Uh, so when you're preaching, you're preparing, it will just reiterate the message. It will just help you to go through the notes. Uh, learning can be reiterated. Anyone else like to share? I'll, I'll share, ma'am. Sorry, Dave, we can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yeah, a little louder, please. Uh, yeah. I'll try to speak as loud as I can. So, yeah. so throughout uh, this this class, uh, it really help uh, help someone who is uh, ministering or who is uh, in a pastoral or or an elder or a leader. To, to grasp the actual um, character of a leader and uh, actual character of a pastor, even though we know what we do, what we need to do uh, generally in our mind, but being a pastor, being a, a, a minister is uh, is a calling and it's, uh, it needs um, the character from, from what God expects us to uh, live like. So throughout this book, it really helped me to understand uh, even uh, even though uh, uh, Timothy was a very young uh, young uh, minister, God really worked in his life and uh, to the to the to the church of Thessalonica and uh, and even 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 to the book of Phil, uh, Philemon also. Um, yeah, we 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 as Paul said, we actually we are um, uh, a slave to God. Uh, we are his uh, his own slip. So sometimes we 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 think we have gone out and we want to be free, like uh, Onishima said. We, we we go out of our 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 care, but but we it's time for us to come back to his uh, his uh, his boundary and do what God has intended us to do. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Uh, thank you for sharing that. Yes, so true. You know. Uh, we think freedom is when we walk away, uh, we can do what we want, but uh, freedom is actually can be enjoyed in the boundaries that God sets for us, uh, in the place that God wants us to be. It's where we enjoy true freedom, we enjoy true purpose, meaning and joy in life. That's so true. Like the prodigal son, he wanted freedom uh, from his father. He went back, he went away from his father, but, you know, he did not enjoy uh, freedom in that fullest sense. Uh, so he realized that freedom and joy is, is you know, 
where you really belong. So he comes back to his father. I think Onesim has also uh, realized that then. So it's always, uh, you know, our freedom, our joy can be experienced uh, when we are in the truth, because the truth that sets us free. And the truth is only in the presence of God, is where God uh, wants us to be, is where God has portioned for us to be and positioned us for us to be. Stand, then we receive um, uh, his blessing. So even if you look at the entire scripture, when somebody has positioned themselves to be in the place where God wants them to be, they receive blessings, they receive uh, uh, protection, they receive freedom, they receive joy, they receive uh, uh, everything from God. But the moment they step out, case, take the case of David, case, take the case of uh, Solomon, the moment they step out, you know, uh, they don't really enjoy freedom. But we see that uh, Paul, even though he was in prison in chains, uh, you know, he enjoys, uh, he he uh, he was uh, so filled with joy and hope that even as he's writing Second Timothy, he knows that he's going to die any moment. Uh, but there's so much of joy, hope, uh, because of, uh, you know, uh, he knows uh, he's, he's, he's in that place where God wants him to be in the very presence of God. Yeah, such a powerful truth. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, these books are a good uh, uh, teach as well about how to be good leaders, how to run the church of God. Yes. Anyone else likes to share? Okay, if not, we'll, uh, we'll we'll finish this course. So thank you all for uh, journeying through with this course. Um, I hope, uh, I mean, I'm sure it has benefited you because this is God's word. Uh, any feedback, uh, please feel share to share your feedback on the uh, in the Google Classroom. Uh, you can share your positive and your negative feedback. It just helps how to improve the class. Um, I'm welcome to any feedback. It just helps me improve because sometimes I really don't know, you know. Uh, we just keep going on. Uh, we don't know, but uh, your feedback, your suggestions can really help improve um, uh, uh, our teaching, our teaching skills, uh, the future as well. So please don't hesitate to give any feedback saying, oh, it's a negative feedback. It's not because can't can't be a negative feedback because it's always going to help uh, me be a better teacher and how I can improve, how I can better communicate, um, um, you know, uh, the lessons uh, to uh, the future students. So you'll be helpful in doing that. So please feel free to post your uh, or leave your feedback on the Google Classroom page. And this Friday, you have your test on Titus, right? Um, that is a 20 mark test. And then I think you have one in April for uh, Titus, uh, sorry, if for uh, Philemon. Uh, so this uh, Friday is your test on um, Titus and um, when do you want to have your uh, test on Philemon? Can we just decide a date quickly? Anyone can suggest in April, a date in April, please? Anyone would like to suggest a date in April? Because I'm sure you have a lot of assignments. When is starting month of April, is it OK? Yeah, so give me a date, dear, please. Any date you'd like to give? What about the uh, 8th April? Is it okay? April, okay, ma'am. Okay, yeah. April 8th is a Friday. Is it okay with, for everybody? Okay, uh, not Friday. Okay. Then what about uh, April 7th? April 7th is a Thursday. Is April 7th fine with all of you? 
if you say April 7th, then you can submit it by April 8th. Is that okay? Thomas is fine. Kanan is fine. Dave, are you okay for April 7th? Or do you want to move it to April 6th? April 6th will be fine, ma'am. Okay. Because April 7th and 8th, I won't be in the station. I would be traveling out. So. Okay, great. So okay, April 6th is fine with all of you? Fine with me. Okay, fine with Dave. Thomas, are you okay? Kannan, are you okay? Just put a thumbs up quickly so we know. April 6th. Okay, Kannan, thank you. Thomas, thank you. Kiran, you're okay April 6th? Yes, ma'am. Okay, okay thank you. Okay, fine. So then we'll have it on April 6th, yeah. Okay, thank you all so much for joining this course and... Uh, uh, God bless each one of you and uh, may the seeds of God's word that is sown, you know, bear fruit in your life. Uh, God bless you all. Okay. Thank you.